happy to introduce the man that talks me off the wall when I get a little crazed with my liver issues. And this morning, it is my pleasure to introduce the driver of my bus. And when I say the driver of my bus, um, it is Dr. Jennifer Pate. She obtained her BA in psychology with a minor emphasis in philosophy in May of 1992. She graduated magna cum laude from the University of St. Thomas in Houston, and then was awarded her MD from UT Medical Branch Galveston in October of 2000. She is a res was a resident in general psychiatry from January 2001 to December 04 in the Menninger Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences with Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. She is currently Chief of Psychiatry at, at CHI St. Luke's Hospital, a clinical assistant professor of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences with the University of Texas Medical Branch, and provides the liver transplant and family education class at St. Luke's Hospital in Houston. This is all in addition to her private practice. Um, one of her specialties and one of the things that has been so wonderful to me is I fought the idea of going to see a psychiatrist. Dr. Ancomase argued with me. He says, go see Jennifer. I said, I'm not crazy. He said, go see Jennifer. I said, I'm still not crazy. Last week, I apologized to him and said, I should have been seeing her all along. This is the woman that will help us all learn how to cope with chronic illness, how to not let PBC define us, but how we will all live with the disease, get stronger, and it is my pleasure to introduce my bus driver, Jennifer Pate. I didn't expect that introduction. That is actually really quite nice, and I have to say I'm proud to be Tina's bus driver. Um, all right, so you've heard a whole lot about your liver and what it's doing with PBC. So what I'm going to talk about is how to live with your liver. Um, so what I'm going to talk to, about today is how to cope with both PBC and other chronic illnesses. So let's just jump right in and get started. And also some of the things that Tina talked about in terms of the most bothersome symptoms in PBC and related conditions, including fatigue and itching and dry mouth, I'll talk um, a little bit about. So I'll give you guys some ideas about that too, because that is really what I spend my day doing. I would say about 90% 98% of my practice um, involves taking care of patients with liver disease. I see about 2% of other stuff, but really my first love is taking care of patients with liver disease. So, um, all right, so chronic illness affects probably everybody in this room to one degree or another. Um, one of every two Americans has a chronic illness, um, or 133 million people in the U.S. And as you've, I'm sure you've heard many, many times over the yesterday and today, 19 to 402 cases of PBC occur per 1 million people. So in addition to the physical challenges of the illness, really managing the psychological issues uh, are actually very problematic and take their toll as well. All right, so let's talk about um, some of the psychological challenges of PBC. So first of all, it can be difficult to understand, you know, well, what are those bile ducts and what are they doing and what are those enzymes and where do they come from and, and what are these medicines and what does all this mean? It can be actually quite a, a challenge to understand. So as all of you know firsthand, whenever you talk to a friend or a coworker and say, hey, I have PBC, you know, or I have a liver disease, everybody thinks you drink too much. Oh, well, maybe you need to quit drinking. Okay, great, that's, that's helpful. Um, so the other thing too is, you know, even though Dr. Veerling and I are really good at what we do, you know, we can't actually see your liver and know what it's doing. So you have an invisible illness, you know, there's no, you know, equivalent to like a glucometer where you can go stick your finger 
and, you know, do a test and, and see how your liver's doing that day. It doesn't work like that. So the challenge of having an invisible illness. Whenever you have a significant diagnosis of an illness like PVC, it also changes your identity. Who am I now that I have this illness? You know, what does all this mean? How much is this going to impact my life? Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty about the future, although, like Dr. Veerling said, there's a whole lot less uncertainty than there used to be. So one of the unfortunate things about PBC and autoimmune liver diseases is that your chances of developing another illness over time are actually fairly significant. So about one-third of PBC patients go on to develop an autoimmune disease of another type, whether it's um, thyroid disease or some other autoimmune disease. One of the things I hear about often as one of the big challenges that my patients with significant fatigue in particular experience is how difficult it is to repeatedly disappoint themselves and other people. You know, you, expand, you expect to go out to dinner with friends on Saturday night and you know, early afternoon you've just hit a wall and you just realize, okay, dinner's just never going to happen. So that can also be really, you know, difficult and it's hard to repeatedly disappoint people over time. Um, the symptoms such as itching and fatigue do not correspond to how severe your liver disease is. So I have patients with very advanced disease who are, you know, active on the liver transplant list who may not feel all that tired or may not have all that much itching, whereas I may have a patient with very mild disease on their liver biopsy who's really quite impaired by the fatigue or the itching. So that's one of the frustrating things too, is you can't tell, oh, okay, I'm itching a lot more, that means my disease is worse. It just, it's not a linear correlation like that. All right, so let's talk about the reaction to the diagnosis, um, particularly if you were just recently diagnosed. I think there's a, a certain amount of shock, you know, you know, by definition, people have this disease through no fault of their own, meaning you didn't drink, you didn't use IV drugs, and so it's not that you can identify any kind of behavior that led to this. You know, this is an autoimmune disease, so a lot of people are told, hey, you have this autoimmune liver disease, and, and a lot of times patients are really quite shocked. Um, since we can't see it, and you can't quantify it every day, a lot of times it's hard to believe that you really have it. You know, well, you can't see it, you know, so therefore maybe it's not really there. Or a lot of patients try to pretend that it's not. Um, sadness or, you know, what I see a lot is people really catastrophizing, particularly when it was called primary biliary cirrhosis. Oh my God, you know, cirrhosis, that means I'm going to die. Well, even if you have cirrhosis, that doesn't mean you're going to die. That's a whole different topic and, and uh, you know, reason for education. But a lot of people freak out and think, you know, that this is the end of the world. And, and actually, especially with, some, with the new therapies, that's not the case at all. Um, again, I mentioned denial, the ability to kind of bury your head in the sand and pr pretend that this isn't really an issue. Um, sometimes, uh, particularly for my patients who are very symptomatic with fatigue, okay, it helps to have an answer that I'm not crazy, that there's a medical explanation for uh, the fatigue. All right, so let's talk about that. That's one of the most disabling symptoms. That's a reason why people are referred to me. That's actually one of the things I'm really good at treating. Um, it's very rewarding for me to treat because um, I can actually say that in every case of PBC in my practice, I've gotten it better. So um, the, it's very difficult to talk to your doctors about fatigue because I think doctors, family members, and friends kind of, maybe they don't say this, but you kind of get the sense that they're kind of kicking back and looking at you like, really? You know, I, how bad can it be? you know, you look pretty good, you're going to work, you know, and, and you think, oh my God, you know, the doctor's just sitting there thinking, 
oh my God, she's just so whiny. Uh, and the reality is they probably don't really get it, um, but I can say that I do. Um, so the other thing too, and I've mentioned this before, but I think it's important to remember, is worse fatigue does not mean worse liver disease. Um, again, I gave the example before and I won't go over that again. Um, one of the frustrating things for the few patients that I do have who have received a liver transplant is the fatigue doesn't always improve after transplant. And that's particularly shocking for my transplant patients because they think, you know, oh, I'm finally going to have a better energy level. Well, you might from your immunosuppression that we put you on first um, post-transplant, but as that's tapered and you're you're sort of restored to your new baseline, the fatigue's not always better. But again, I've also been 100% successful in getting it better post-transplant. So the good news is we can do stuff to help. Um, the other thing too, and this is something that doctors consistently get wrong. If the doctor first understands that you really are fatigued, then they often automatically assume that fatigue is depression. Okay, you're complaining of being so tired, therefore you are depressed. And actually the two are not the same thing. You may be fatigued and be depressed, but just because you're fatigued does not mean you're depressed. And um, unfortunately, a lot of doctors just don't understand that. Um, there are symptomatic treatments available. Let's talk about that. So let's say you are both fatigued and depressed, okay? And again, fatigue does not equal depression. But let's just say you have both. So one of the best antidepressants for that is actually Welbutrin. And the newest form of that is Welbutrin XL. That is our most activating antidepressant on the market. I like to refer to it as my couch potato antidepressant. So for people who are depressed, laying around, sitting on the couch, have no get up and go, have no motivation, no interest in anything, if I'm looking at my menu of antidepressants that are safe in liver disease, which the vast majority of antidepressants on the market can be used in different ways in patients with liver disease. Over here is my most activating antidepressant, which is Welbutrin XL. And for a patient with PBC who's also fatigued, it may be my antidepressant of choice. Over things like Lexapro and Celexa and Prozac and Zoloft, Welbutrin XL has a little bit more spunk and get up and go to it. So. Um, if that's an issue for you, you might want to talk to your doctor about Wellbutrin XL. Um, again, um, I have no financial conflicts of interest. I'm not, I'm not supporting any drug. I'm not suggesting you should be on any particular drug. I'm just talking about what works. All right, so probably one of my most common treatments for fatigue in PBC that is usually quite successful is New Vigil or Pro Vigil. Um, New Vigil is the newer, better form of the medicine that just in June of 2016, so the month we're in, it just went generic. So that means it's going to be much more available to patients and um, insurance companies are going to cover it better since it's a generic and it's likely be going to be a little bit more affordable. It's still pretty pricey, um, but there are... Um, for the branded version of it, there are good copay cards available. The other thing too that I use quite often, primarily in more advanced disease, but I have a really low threshold for using it in anybody with PBC, are stimulants such as those you'd use to treat ADHD. So that means things like Ritalin, Vyvanse, um, those have an immediate effect. You take the dose early this morning, you're going to feel a difference today. And the nice thing, particularly for people with advanced disease, is Ritalin is so short-acting that even with a liver that's not functioning up to speed, 
it's still going to be cleared by the time you go to bed tonight. So it's not likely to make you more, um, give you more trouble sleeping. Um, so um, those are some great options. For those of you with more advanced disease who may be on a beta blocker for portal hypertension, those of you who have been told you have esophageal varices, you may be on drugs such as Natalol or Propranolol. The, one of the things that I do, I even had one patient that I saw and all I did was I switched the beta blocker to bedtime. It is incredibly helpful to switch it to bedtime to help with daytime fatigue. Just that simple change can make a big difference. All right, so let's talk about some real world pointers for fatigue other than medications. Um, so it's sort of a no brainer, but you ought to plan activities for the best part of the day. Think about, okay, well, how do I function best? Are you a morning person? So when you're talking about getting together with friends, plan a breakfast or plan a brunch. Don't plan a late dinner because it's just going to improve, it's just going to increase the chances that you're not going to feel up to doing it. So plan activities for your best part of the day. This is a really hard one, but limit napping to avoid disrupting your sleep. Or if you're going to nap, I would say nap for about an hour or less. Um, because otherwise, you're going to get into trouble where it's difficult to sleep that night. Um, optimize sleep hygiene. Um, I talk about this a lot with patients. Um, everybody thinks that going to bed with the TV on helps them. It absolutely does not. Research shows that the little tiny lights in a TV stimulate your brain to stay awake. So that's going to get in the way of sleeping. Um, I'll talk about itching in a minute, but one of the things, too, that's important, especially during the Houston summers, is make sure that you're keeping your room cool. Go to bed with it dark. Um, if you have a lot of trouble with insomnia, do something non-electronic, um, such as reading a paper book. Um, again, you want to avoid computerized devices because little tiny lights will keep your brain awake. Um, avoid supplements and energy drinks, as Dr. Veerling can attest to. Several times a year, we have somebody come in just who was previously healthy, come in in full-blown liver failure. We are all emergently working to try to get the patient listed for transplant because they used some supplements. And so um, patients ask me all the time, what kind of liver cleaner can I use? There is no safe way to clean your liver. Um, so I recommend avoiding any kind of supplement or energy drink, particularly those that are going to help with weight loss or energy. They are really very dangerous. And as most of you know, supplements are not under the jurisdiction of the FDA. So I could say that my bottle of water is a liver cleaner. You guys would believe it. And there's, the FDA does not police this, so I'm allowed to say this is a liver cleaner. So just stay away from all of that, especially since you have a liver disease. Um, this is a hard one, but do some low-impact exercise at least several times a week. It's getting to be very hot in Houston right now. One of the things I recommend regularly is that you, you should go walk a mall. It's an air-conditioned place where you can safely walk. Um, it's just getting way too hot to walk outside. Um, but do some low-impact exercise several times a week. Um, that will also actually, ironically, help the fatigue. Um, if you're super, super, super tired, um, limit your time in bed because you'll likely end up deconditioned, and that's really a big mountain to overcome. All right, so let's talk about itching in PBC. I actually had the wonderful opportunity to go to New York to meet with Nora Bergaza, and I actually learned quite a bit from her, and I used what I learned, um, what I learned um, uh, several times a week. So as you guys know, the medical term for itching is pruritus. Itching is much easier for me to say, so I'm going to call it itching. 
Um, so about 80% of patients with PVC experience itching. It is worse in warm weather. It is also worse after a warm shower. So one of the things I do is I talk to patients about, well, what time of day do you shower? And if patients say I shower at night and their itching is really bad, I'll say switch your shower to the morning because that way the itching won't keep you up at night because you don't want to trigger that whole sequence of events of showering at night and end up staying up all night itching. Staying up all night is bad enough by itself. It also tends to be worse at night apart from showering at night. So you've got a couple of different factors to work with, so you want to do everything you can to help it at night. That's also why you want to sleep in a cooler room. So all you guys in the room who have a wife that's itching, just you know, uh, bundle up in a blanket, she's gonna want it cold. Um, topical treatments are actually, I said not always helpful. I would say they are rarely helpful. My PBC patients often go to see a dermatologist and they're told to use a steroid cream. A steroid cream won't help this at all. It's not a topical skin problem. As John mentioned in his talk, it's a problem with bile acids and endogenous opiates and a whole lot of biochemical substances you guys don't care about. But it is not that you got poison ivy and you're itching. So some of the best treatments that I have found are the antidepressant Zoloft and the, the medications Cholestopol or Cholestyramine. So cholestopol and cholestyramine are, are fairly similar. The difference being cholestopol is a pill. Cholestyramine is a gritty orange flavored powder that doesn't dissolve in the liquid very well. So my patients tell me it's like drinking ground up sandpaper. I don't know about you, I'd rather take a pill than drink sandpaper. So, um, there's a huge dose range on the cholestopol, but typically a very low dose helps my patients. I would say that there are two big drawbacks. One is cholestopol is a big pill, but you can split it in half. The other thing too is it needs to be carefully timed with other medicines so it does not inactivate your medicines. Um, you can certainly work with your pharmacist to figure out how to time things. This is particularly challenging for my patients who are on meds three or four times a day, but I can say the vast majority of my patients improve on cholestopol. Um, I do not use the opiate antagonists much because they have some liver toxicity of their own, and I, I don't use rifampin either um, just because I'm a little scared of the liver toxicity, and, and I don't want some patient going back to the liver team and being like, yeah, Dr. Pate told me the, to take this stuff, and the team's like, that's just great, and, you know, that I caused the patient some further damage. So these things that I'm talk, talking about almost always work. I can't think of a patient I've had that has not gotten better from these. The other thing, too, that Dr. Bergasa taught me about are um, light boxes. Um, it has to be 10,000 lux. That's a strength of a light box. Um, these are available at Amazon. They're actually not that expensive and can actually be quite helpful. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about the question of am I sick, tired, depressed, anxious, or all of the above? Okay, so we pretty much covered sick, we covered tired, let's cover depressed and anxious. All right, so I'll ask a lot of my patients, so are you feeling depressed? And most of them understand what I mean by that, but I have a few patients who are like, mm, I don't know what that means. So depressed means you're feeling sad or down most of the time. By definition, it's supposed to be for two weeks, but you know I don't really stick to the definition that much. It's more an overall picture. Um, have you lost interest in things you're doing? Um, or do you find you aren't going to do the things that you usually like to do as often? Have you had a significant weight loss or a weight gain? And I would say 
that is not due to a medical reason. Okay, we can be put on medicines and um, those may cause significant weight gain. That is not an indication that you're depressed, you're having a medication side effect. Um, you may have sleep disturbance, sleeping too much, too little, psychomotor agitation or re retardation. That means you're moving a whole lot more or a whole lot less than you normally would. Um, fatigue, this is not a good symptom for you guys because fatigue and PBC are sort of a deal. Um, so if somebody's fatigued, I usually attribute it more to the PBC than to the fact that they're depressed unless they're clearly depressed. Feelings of worthlessness or guilt or feeling like I'm too much of a burden on my family. Um, poor concentration or indecisiveness. Um, thoughts about death, particularly would I be better off if I was dead? You know, maybe my family would be better off as, if I was dead. If you start thinking maybe I should kill myself and here are the ways I should kill myself, okay, that's a psychiatric emergency and you need to go to the ER. Um, so in one study of patients with PBC, 24% of patients um, reported symptoms of depression. So there is some significant overlap. And the good news is it's very treatable. All right, so challenges to the depression diagnosis. A lot of doctors think that it's expected that a patient is depressed if they have a serious illness. I see this all the time. Well, I see lots of patients who are actively dying or have horrific medical situations who are not depressed.